This is the current federal tax developments for the week of February the 5th, 2018. I'm Ed Zollers, and I'm going to be presenting this week information related to what's happened this week in federal taxes. As always, these programs are brought to you by your State Society of CPAs and those of us here at Kaplan Professional Education that work on the accounting side of, the, of this area. Uh, we do live CPE for the state societies, as well as we have other issues and other things that we take care of over in the Smart Pros section. But what we're going to talk about this week is a number of interesting developments, including an AICPA letter to the Treasury regarding what we need guidance on right away. We'll talk about the IRS giving some guidance uh, to sort of tide us over on Form W-4 until the IRS gets out some updated guidance and some updated W-4s for the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. A new proposed regulation was added to the centralized partnership audit regime this week. We'll talk about what that goes over, what that impacts. And finally, the IRS, well, not really, but kind of updates. It's what used to be the annual revenue procedure. Uh, didn't really change anything on disclosure and how that should work. Well, let's get ourselves to our first development this week. And we're going to talk right off about a letter that the AICPA wrote, the United States Treasury regarding issues arising from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that need guidance. Now, the AICPA, being formally correct, doesn't refer to it as the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act directly, but of course refers to it as Public Law Number 115-97. As we've discussed before, officially that's the name of this thing, because the name violated in ways that shall best be called uh, difficult to understand and arcane, uh, which is what all the rules are with the bird, bird rule to a large extent, but it violated the bird rule. So the bill formerly known as the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, and what we're going to all call that. The AICPA's letter went to the Treasury. And what it really is, is there's a two-page cover letter that was sent to the Treasury. And that was followed up by a, what's a what is a 12-page memo by code section of areas needing guidance. The IRS was going to essentially giving the IRS where issues that the AICPA believes the Treasury should concentrate on issuing guidance. The letter specifically emphasizes the need for having Section 199 Cap A information as soon as possible for qualified business income. The letter also points out that Section 41 for accounting method changes related to the new rules, what guidance we have there. And finally, some information related to penalty relief for underpayments. Those are the three main areas highlighted in the letter. However, the memo goes on and by code section talks about a whole number of areas where the AICPA sees that we need some additional guidance. I mean, we go from the mundane, like if you have an employee who incurred moving expenses in 17, the employer reimburses them in 18. Is that taxable? Is that not taxable? You know, how do we handle that, that situation to a long list of things on Section 199 and then various other aspects of the law that their concern needs a little bit of additional guidance, in essence, to, you know, understand and take care of that issue and how we're going to handle it. This list of things that are not, you know, not clear, and I think it's a pretty good list of things that we'll say in the law that are not clear. It's not comprehensive by any means. There's other things that if you start thinking for a while are not clear, but these are the ones presumably that the AICPA's various task forces that concentrate in special areas of the tax law. And if, you, if you've been around or take a look at the AICPA's tax section, you'll find that we have all of these various uh, task forces and uh, that relate, that come back in and work on specific areas of the law. And these volunteers tend to be very specialized, know their areas, and this funneled up through the Tax Executive Committee. The tax Executive Committee then ends up drafting this letter of what we need guidance on, guys, just like right now, and sends that on to Treasury. As we mentioned last week, all that coverage tax analysts had in tax notes regarding statements made by Treasury officials, one of the key issues that was stated last week was that they expect the guidance here is going to take from 12 to 18 months to get guidance out. So, some of these things on this 12-page memo hopefully will have guidance before the 12 to 18 months are up, but I wouldn't necessarily hold my breath too long. Some of these may not turn up, but at least this area gives you a good checklist 
of things that you probably might want to consider and maybe gives you some thoughts about areas that you hadn't considered were unclear under the law, but when you think about it, probably are. This letter is available on the AICPA's website. We also will have a link to it on our website, currentfelltaxdevelopments.com, in the article about this letter. We'll take you back to that particular location. But you do not, as far as it appears, do not have to be an AICPA member to access this letter. So if you need to, go ahead, get in and take a look at this and see what the AICPA is talking about being a major problem in this law. Certainly, there are enough things to look at. We come back to it, right? Very useful for finding out things that are just unclear under this law. Then we go on now. The IRS is dealing with another area that probably a lot of normal taxpayers that aren't CPAs trying to handle all this planning look at as being a big problem. This was in notice 2018-14. This is the IRS providing information related to how we're going to handle certain W-4 issues uh, related to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. The first thing they did was extend the effective period of Form W-4 that where a taxpayer claimed exemption from income tax withholding. Normally, those only count through the middle of February. They're going to extend that all the way to the end of February. So somebody who has a 17 W-4 that claimed to be exempt from taxation, you continue to treat them as exempt from tax for withholding purposes all the way through the end of February. Obviously, if they tell you differently, you'll treat them differently. This gives a break. They don't have to submit a brand new W-4. Uh, claiming that they're exempt from tax because the IRS hasn't published the guidance about how you would determine that little fact and how you could properly file such a form. We also temporarily suspend the requirement that you have to submit a revised W-4 within 10 days after there's been an event that causes you to have a reduced number of allowances you should be claiming on the Form W-4. For instance, you have 10 days to submit that Let's say if you had a divorce that became final, and so the number of your dependents and your marital status is about to change, so this requires a change in the W-4, you have 10 days to make that happen. Now, of course, they don't care about if your number of allowances go up. They're just concerned about going down in this range. Well, that's going to be suspended for a while until we actually get this new form out. We also provide information on the optional withholding rate uh, on supplemental wage payments. That's kind of the bonus payment rate. That drops because the rate dropped from 25 to 22 in the regular tax tables that have been used for this purpose. The IRS has now officially made official here in notice 2814 that that optional rate will also drop from 25 to 22% for your optional rates. And finally, we also go down to what about periodic payments uh, on what will be annuity payments of some sort, which would be things like you know, your retirement payments and those sorts of things, other annuities. By default, if a taxpayer has not filed a form indicating that they don't want taxes withheld, which is perfectly okay for them to do regardless of their income, the, and they don't give them a W-4 specifying how many, you know, what their status should be and what to withhold, the rules provided in the past, they would be treated as a married individual claiming three withholding allowances, Notice 2814 goes ahead and extends that treatment. It will still be, you'll be married, you'll be a married filing joint, file, you know, a married joint, married individual, we should say, claiming three withholding allowances if you do not file a Form W-4 with the pension plan telling them how much you want to have withheld. This guidance, of course, a lot of it is going to essentially be uh, temporary until such time as actually update their W-4 information and update the withholding and exemption calculator on the website. They also claim to be working on that at this point. Well, you know, you might have even forgotten about the fact that the centralized partnership audit regime that was part of the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2015 took effect on January 1st of 2018 for tax returns for tax years beginning that date. And early this month in January, the AICPA yet again wrote the IRS, asked them to delay the effective date. The IRS has continued to ignore that, which unfortunately I believe they will continue to do because their theory is going to be we don't have the authority. Congress set the date. We have to work with the date. And the IRS now went and filled in the blanks on some areas where they had reserved guidance in the original June 14th proposed regulations. They now issued in Reg 118067-17 
that was published on February 1st of 2018. They gave us information on how we're going to handle attributes. Okay, this is additional guidance. It's under the Bipartisan Budget Act 2015's new partnership audit regime, or what's being referred to as CPAR, right? CPAR, Centralized Partnership Audit Regime. So under the CPAR regime, this gives us guidance, and the key guidance here is going to deal with attributes, right? We're going to determine various attributes, how they're impacted. Remember, under the centralized partnership audit rules, under those rules, we are going to have an exam take place. There will be changes made, just like currently under, under, TEFRA, part, under TEFRA exams. So under TEFRA exam, we have a centralized exam. We examine the partnership's books from the partnership's books. We make various changes. Now, in TEFRA, when we finished at that point, the IRS would then have to issue assessments, statements and assessments to all of the partners of the partnership and go after them for payment. In the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2015, Congress changed that, again, effective for returns for years beginning January 1st, 2018, to have by default the partnership will pay a tax. And that tax by default will be imposed on the partnership at the highest individual rates. For 2018, that would be 37%. So if, let's say, the partnership had $100,000 worth of adjustments, the IRS had found $100,000 worth of deductions that should not have been claimed, we would take 100,000 times 37%, 37,000. We would also compute interest and penalties back to the date that, it, you know, to the year that was under exam. And the partnership would pay that. Now that's all well and good, but partnership and subchapter K is still has to be recognized as working under the individual partners have various attributes. Those attributes are affected by what passes through and generally what had been reported on their return. Obviously, if the partnership pays this, and we'll talk about there's an alternative where the partnership could have the partners pay it, but if the partnership pays an adjustment, then nothing ever passed out to go on the individual tax returns. Well, because of that, Congress provided that the IRS was to write rules that would make those adjustments. And that's what these rules are in this particular set of proposed regulations. If we take, if we don't do the push out, we'll talk about the push out here in just a second. But if we don't push out the adjustments, to the partners who were there in the reviewed years, but we instead pay them in the current year, then this proposed reg, takes us, forces us, and it'll be Reg 301-6225-4B, two will be where we make those adjustments. The partnership has to make adjustments to the book value of assets that it's holding, right? And the basis of property. It needs to take into account adjustments under 704C. Remember the 704C rules are when a partner contributes property to the partnership. It has a different basis than fair value. It also comes up if you have a recapitalization of the partnership. Those are various issues where we have them. The partnership has to go modify that as necessary. Uh, we also have a special rule there. The IRS says in this proposed reg, they're trying to deal with one other issue. What happens if we had a change that affects the basis of property the partnership no longer has? Well, the proposed regs say that we just don't do anything with that adjustment. We don't adjust the basis of anything. But they are asking for comments about whether that should, that should be either require or allow an adjustment similar to the one we make under 734B. 734B comes into effect, let's say, for example, number of occasions, usually on distributions. But for instance, let's say when a partner leaves the partnership and recognizes a gain or loss on their interest, that generally triggers a, if you have the 754 election in place, the 734B adjustment. You know, should we have something similar? We no longer have the property. That doesn't mean it didn't have an impact somewhere or shouldn't have had an impact. So the IRS is suggesting maybe we need to allow the partnership an adjustment. Similarly, the partners need to adjust their basis. If the partners don't adjust the basis in their interest, here's what's going to be the problem. The partnership, let's say, has paid tax on 100 grand. But if we don't adjust the basis of the partner's interest up, when the partners sell their interest or otherwise dispose of it, they're going to effectively pay a second tax on 100 grand because nobody got a basis just before it. So under these rules, we're going to take into what they call notional items. These aren't really flowing out to you. We're going to treat them like they flowed out to you. They're going to be the income, deductions, all those things coming through. And we're going to figure out what their impact is on the basis in your interest. Now. 
one of the problems we have with CPAR is, you know, we examine a 2018 return. We don't finish the exam till 2022. In 2022, there's a decent chance that we don't have exactly the same partners with exactly the same interests that we had back in 2018. So the question becomes, how do we handle that? Well, somebody who has the same interest beginning, same interest in, that pretty easy to figure out how we allocate that person's, uh, you know, changes because we'll just do their portion of it. But this gets more complicated. How do we handle it if the taxpayer, you know, let's say the, the partner is no longer there? Well, the IRS points out that we really still need to make a basis adjustment. Why? Because again, the partnership's paid tax on 100 grand. And if we don't adjust somebody's basis, then effectively the partner that left or the part, you know, the partner that left and or the partner who's still there, somebody's going to pay tax on that 100 grand again, at least their portion of it. So we are going to adjust the successor partner. Now, here's where it gets interesting. We got to figure out who the successor partner is. And they provide rules for figuring out who's the successor so we can allocate that adjustment to that person. We also have discussion in there about the methods of how we're going to handle partners' capital accounts. And they're going to take a look there at, it appears from the regulation, that the partnership agreement can provide issues on that, but it's still got to meet all the standard rules for having you know, substantial economic effect of such allocations. We also have to, as they say, the IRS points out, these could not have substantial economic effect because obviously nobody's picking up the income. So we couldn't meet those rules. But what we're going to test is if we had flowed this out, would that have met substantial economic effect? The regs also then go on and say, you know, we don't have to pay the partnership level. The partnership may elect to push out the adjustments. The regs go on and describe how that would happen and the way we do it. One interesting aside there, you know, you might think, well, I, I should be able to go back and adjust the basis as it was back in 2018. Let's say on the 2022, they, they suggest, no, that all the adjustments are going to take place in the year in which the adjustment statement goes out to the partners rather than going back to the original year. Most often that won't have a significant impact, but it could. So keep your eyes on that. All of this, as I said, is part of the new centralized partnership audit, re audit regime. Uh, don't forget, this is just a small part of it. That regime is coming into effect this year. And that was going to be the big story until we got tax reform. Well, that, this story is really no smaller than it was, and it's no less important than it was. So you want to make sure you don't get and get to the point where you forget that these rules are here. And we really need to get our partnership agreements straightened out and get them into shape for dealing with these rules. Because come next year this time, you're going to be trying to prepare tax returns and you've got to make decisions at return time under these rules for things like who the partnership representative is going to be and whether we're going to opt out if we can. And somehow we've got to figure out how to make those decisions. And that means that we probably need to get those partnership agreements revised in the current year. Final update this week, the IRS, after skipping a year in Revenue Procedure 2018-11, issued on January the 26th, has finally re-updated their disclosure revenue procedure. This procedure talks about what will represent adequate disclosure on a tax return. And the importance of that is, if you don't adequately disclose a position on a tax return, the taxpayer may face penalties for the inadequate disclosure. And for some of the things they talk about here, could at least theoretically end up with an incomplete return, which could subject the client to additional penalties. You know, for filing late, could have the statute theoretically stay open. The IRS has never asserted that as far as I'm aware, but the theoretical basis is there. Uh, and, you know, it just causes lots of issues we prefer to avoid. So this thing was updated. Now, the IRS normally has been, normally publishes this annually, but for reasons they don't explain, never did, they skipped 2017. The last version of this came out in 16. We skipped 17. Now, you might say it's because nothing really changed and didn't do anything new. And that probably was true because this one actually makes no significant changes. But despite the fact they really told you that all, all we did was make some minor grammar changes, uh, you know, and nothing else really changed, they still felt the need to publish this year 
My guess is that they were, you know, last year was a whole lot of uncertainty about whether the tax, whether the health care bill would go through fast. That if it did, would we have tax reform quickly? Could that reform go back into 16? There are all kinds of questions. I think last year just kept the IRS jumping. Uh, this year, they've decided we're going back to the standard. We're going to publish this thing every year. This document you need to review carefully to understand what adequate disclosure will be. The basic gist of this, although you really need to take a look at the details because there are detailed issues for certain types of expenses, certain types of income, certain lines on the return. But generally, you're going to have to comply with the instructions. Yes, yes, I do mean that. You have to read IRS instructions. And one of the requirements to have adequate disclosure and to properly prepare the return is that you have to follow the instructions and provide the information requested. Uh, some people might think, well, no, 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 those are just instructions. They're not binding. True, they're not binding on the IRS, but they are within the IRS's authority to tell you how they want you to report. And any information that is requested in the instructions generally is going to be considered to be required to be provided by the taxpayer under these rules. We had the case of Deutsche Bank a couple of years back where failing to provide information requested in the instructions proved to be fatal to their attempt to get a ref to get interest on their refund that wasn't paid out for an extended period of time. The problem was the tax court ruled that the return not prepared in accordance with the instructions that apply to that return is not processable by the IRS and therefore the time frame for the IRS having to issue a refund before interest would be triggered hadn't even started till the very late part of the process, even though, as Deutsche Bank could show, the IRS actually didn't do anything with the information that had been submitted. It also reminds you that for most disclosures, in fact, the vast majority of disclosures, if you do not have substantial authority, but you have a reasonable basis for the position, the taxpayer needs to file either Form 8275 or if they are disputing a regulation, A275R, in order to have adequate disclosure on the tax return. As I said, this is updated each year. If you have not reviewed this procedure, I do suggest you review it before you start preparing returns this year because it's kind of helpful to know what you have to do to protect your clients so that the IRS cannot claim there was inadequate disclosure and therefore, tough luck, guys, you owe us extra money. Uh, so, you know, so be careful. Watch for that. Well, you know, it's been a little quiet and still continues that way. Part of it is because the new tax law. Part of it, to be honest, is the IRS and anybody else is gearing up. The new tax season begins. Uh, and that's going to be coming us in earnest here shortly. February 15th is approaching. And we all know that's the date when the consolidated 1099s from the brokers are due. And at least for me and my firm, that, that's when the actual tax season really begins in earnest, right? We suddenly have a bunch of forms come in, a bunch of returns come in, a bunch of information comes in. Clients now are willing to talk with us. They're willing to bring stuff in and we start seeing the flood. Uh, that will be coming. During this time though, before the flood starts, be sure to go back and check. Uh, first thing is your state society of CPAs does provide resources that can be very useful to you during tax season. So you wanna go check your local society. Uh, many of the societies archive these posts and these, you know, archive these podcasts. And obviously these podcasts, to the extent they talk about something that's still relevant, uh, can be useful. So we have that there. Most all of them are dealing with attempting to ensure the state legislatures uh, don't do too much damage in trying to adopt the tax law changes. There'll be some major changes we'll take care of this year. And of course, finally, the main thing which we're worried about here is those same state societies will be offering the education that will help you get up to speed on how this wonderful tax law works, especially as we get to just after the year. So if you're not looked at your state society's website, I suggest you do so here shortly. Uh, if you're not a member of the state society, this would be a really good time to go get your membership going. There's a lot of things that are done, a lot of things that happen, you know, that represent you, that get you in front of the state, the state legislatures, that get our voice involved in handling matters to try to make sure we get a workable tax law. You know, generally, we generally at least, well, you know, the committees I've worked on for the AICPA and for the Arizona Society of CPAs, we've not really been out there pushing policy as much. Some places do. There are some times that we do this, and sometimes it goes on. But most of us are out there just simply saying, okay, the, the policy concept to maybe what the proper tax amount collected should be, that, that's a decision for Congress or a decision for the legislature. But we want to try to make sure that whatever they're doing, 
in that regard is workable because no matter no matter your political stripe no matter your you know no matter what your policy is there are workable and not very workable ways to handle all of them and all of this is things that we get help from because of the fact that we have the volunteers working through the state societies and we have the state society staff there to help coordinate all of this so take a look look at your state societies this has been the current federal tax developments again for the week of february the 5th 2018 you can find our current updates online at currentfedaltaxdevelopments.com. We'll post there with developments as they take place during the week. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, you can send them to us here, Ed Zollers at currentfedaltaxdevelopments.com. Uh, I'll try to answer any that I get. If you're on Twitter, uh, you can follow me there at Ed Zollers. I usually post there as I do write-ups. And I also, uh, as I said, follow the Tax Pros subreddit on Reddit. So if you want to go to www.reddit.com slash r slash tax pros, you can find me there uh, going along there with, you know, keeping an idea of what's going on there. If you have questions, that'd be a useful place to pose certain questions where you could have a group of people discuss the answers to those. We expect more to come in the coming weeks, obviously. IRS still has lots of guidance to come out with with DCJA. Uh, and while I'm pretty sure it won't all come out in the next week, Hopefully, we'll begin to get some pieces of it. And in any event, I look forward to you guys joining us again next week when we'll try to take a look at what's happened in that week in the area of federal taxes.